Why Jesus? Why all the talk of crucifixions and the resurrection of the dead? The idea that our present reality can be radically transformed by one historical day from antiquity? Why does this one event persist to shake nations, stands against kingdoms, relentlessly remaining there in every test in time? Why does the life of one rabbi bring hope to the billions and peace beyond understanding, peace even in facing death? His axioms transcend culture, moving between and among every generation, offering new grace with each day to the poor and to the rich, to the young and to the old, each who calls his name. This is not just a page between the chapters of history, neither myth, metaphor, nor a line of spectacular exaggeration. His influence on every human life story is unfit to be placed into any existing category. No, Jesus isn't written into our story. Rather, our story is written into his. Every authority, even the grave, obeys his sovereign will. This is why we exalt the mighty name of Jesus over and over and over again. His victory has given us life. His mercies stand at the center of our faith. He alone holds the pen of history. He is the one true God, and at that, a God who died for us. Why rejoice? Why is this our anthem? The answer for why Jesus comes down to this. Jesus is at the center. His victory over the grave is written into every line. Between old and new, between death and life, there stands one historical reality, the resurrection of Jesus. Good morning, everybody. Happy Easter. So as we gather this morning, well, obviously we're, we're here to celebrate Easter. And for many people, Easter has a lot of different meanings. But obviously when you come and you, you put yourself in a church or somebody dragged you here today, there's one specific reason that we celebrate Easter. And it is not Krispy Kreme, although that's a pretty good reason. It's not Easter bunnies. It's not the, the, the family lunch or dinner that you're going to have today. Although those are all great things. The reason we're here today and the reason that we gather, not just on Easter, but all year round, is because of the fact that Jesus is not dead, he's alive. The resurrection is the reason why we're here. And this morning I want to talk about, just briefly, why we need Easter. Not Easter as the Easter bunnies and Krispy Kreme donuts and all the things that we culturally have created Easter to be, but we need Easter because Easter represents the resurrection and the resurrection of who? Jesus Christ. And ultimately, we need Easter because we all desperately need Jesus. Now, before I talk about the specifics, I'm actually going to talk about six different people today. Three that were Jesus' close friends and three that are my close friends. And I want us to understand the importance of why we need Easter. But before we get that, I want to give us, as, as briefly as I can, some really important context of why Easter is so significant. Why the resurrection is so essential to everything, whether we know it or not. So God created human beings to be in relationship with him. When he created the world, he created a context for you and I to not only have physical life, but to actually live in a connection with God that is what we don't necessarily experience today. But God, in his great wisdom and his love for people, this is what always amazes me, did not create robots. He didn't create you and I and not give us a choice on the way that we're going to choose to live our life, a choice on the whether or not we engage with him. He gave us the capacity to make a choice and knew that in doing that, we would make the wrong choice. We all have. Because we look at our lives and we look at what we want to do and we think, even though we don't say it, we think, I know what's best for me. 
And that's the choice that all humans make. It's the choice that Adam and Eve made, and it's been repeated billions of times over and over and over again. And that choice is, I'm going to choose my way instead of what God desires. When we do that, what happens is there's a broken relationship that now we have with God. Now we've disconnected from him. We're calling the shots. We wouldn't call ourselves God, but we live as though we are. There's a problem with that. When we do that over and over and over again, we get further and further and further away from God, which is the one who created us, who's the one that creates life for us, which is the one who defines what life should look like for, for flourishing and fulfillment for human beings. But what happens is there's such a gap between us and God, we can't make up the gap. We can't find our way back to God even in our best efforts. Humanity tries it. It's called religion. We try to find our way back to God. We try to put ourselves in a situation where we're good or we do good deeds, and somehow that's going to get us one step closer to God. The problem is... God's perfect, and none of us are. I know that's a news flash to some this morning. But we can't get all our way back to God. So what has to happen? Somebody has to pay for that gap. Somebody has to make up that gap. Enter Jesus into the story of human history. He comes in as a human being, being fully God and fully man, lives a life just like us to give us a pathway forward and what it is to fully be human. But then he does something that nobody else could do. He makes up the gap between us and God by dying on the cross. And the, why is that so significant? Well, because there has to be payment made when there's a violation. When there's a relational violation, somebody has to absorb that. Jesus absorbed it on our behalf. But if he would have just done that and died on Friday and Sunday would have just been another Sunday and nothing would have happened, it would have been one mark in history of another person who died, but that's not what happened. Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday because of one thing that Jesus has that we don't have. Perfection. See, sin, when we step away from God, the ultimate payment of that, the only ultimate penalty is death. But if you haven't sinned, you can't die. That's why Jesus rose, because the grave can't hold somebody who's perfect. And then here's the good news. Jesus says, here's the way it works. This is why this, the resurrection is so powerful. Because I've conquered death, I offer you this gift. Here's the gift. You give me your sin, you give me your failed attempts at being God every time you do it, and guess what I'll give you in return? I'll give you my perfection. So that no longer is death the barrier in your life anymore, because now you're like me. You've taken my identity on and become perfect because I've cleansed you from your sin. And this is what it means. Death is the greatest barrier for humanity. If you and I were to go through this every day of our life and think how many different things you and I do either that causes us to react to death, think about death, or avoid death, it dominates our lives. But if someone can overcome death, that's the game changer. Jesus is the only one to overcome death. And he invites us into that. Why is that significant today? Because you and I need Easter. Because we need somebody beyond us. We need somebody more powerful than us. We some, need somebody who can change us because we can't change ourselves. And that's what I want to talk about this morning is why we need Easter, why we need the resurrection. Ultimately, why do we really need Jesus? And so before we, we look at the, the, the people we're going to look at and their stories, I want to ask if you would pray with me because one of the things that is true about this gathering today is that we, we believe that God is actively at work in our lives, and that means that we need to be a, aware and ready for whatever he wants to do. And part of that is getting our hearts and our minds prepared for that. And so in pausing and praying is asking God to help us to hear what he wants to say and then respond accordingly. So would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you that you are alive. That's what we celebrate today. But we also know that you're actively present through your spirit who works in us today. And so you have something for each one of us. So Lord, would you open our ears, soften our hearts, let our eyes see the very things that you want for us today so that we don't somehow miss the significance of what you want to do this Easter in each one of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, so three things I want to cover of why we need the resurrection. The first one is this. You need someone who can set you free. Now, you might think, well, that's great, Pastor John, but I'm not bound, so I don't need anybody setting me free. But the reality for each one of us is all of us find places where we cannot change ourselves, that we cannot get free, we cannot get over limitations or barriers or restri restrictions in our life, even though we try really hard. So one of Jesus' earliest followers is, is a woman named Mary Magdalene. And Mary has this amazing encounter that really I think rivals anything else in Scripture. And it's recorded in John chapter 20. I won't, don't go there, but, but the passages we'll read will be on the screens. But here, here's the reality. She goes to the grave on Sunday morning after watching Jesus die on Friday. She had become a follower of Jesus, 
But she's now, she's going to the grave, not because she believes she's going to find Jesus alive. She's going to the grave because she's still mourning. And when she gets there, to her surprise, the tomb's rolled open and it's empty. That's a shocker. And then here's what's more crazy. Jesus reveals himself to her. Can you imagine that you are the first human being on the face of the earth that Jesus, who's risen from the dead, chooses to reveal himself to? That's a good day. That's a really good day. And so he has this encounter with Mary, and then here's not only that, does Mary get the, the kind of the, the privilege of being the first, but she's the first one to ever tell anybody else that Jesus is alive. She goes and tells the followers, which is like, man, just so you know, I, I just love the, the irony in the story because sometimes our culture is a little male-driven, but who's the first one to see Jesus risen from the dead? It's a woman. Who's the first one to proclaim the gospel? It's a woman. All the guys were a little slow. They had to run later. But this is an amazing encounter, but, but that's not where Mary's story started. Mary's story started much earlier when she came to, to understand who Jesus is. In fact, it's recorded for us in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Listen to what it says about Mary's condition when she encountered Jesus. It says this in verse 1. Soon after, he went on there through city, uh, cities and villages. This is Jesus proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. So that means that it's in her life, there was a period of time where she was dominated by spiritual forces. There was a darkness that followed her life every single day that controlled her, that possessed her to do things probably she didn't want to do. And she could not get free. She could not get beyond that until she met Jesus. He was the only one that had the answer. And you got to think in her story, she was aware of some struggle that she had. And I'm sure there was lots of attempts to try to change things and make herself better and find freedom. But she couldn't do it apart from Jesus. But then she met Jesus. And he knew what her issue was. Her issue wasn't modifying her behavior. Wasn't trying to be a better person. Her issue was in her soul. Her soul was sick, and it was dominated by spiritual forces, so Jesus has the answer because, it meant, it meant, so you know, Jesus kind of knows the end of the story, even though he walked through it. He knows he's going to rise from the dead. He knows he has power, not only over death, but he has power over spiritual forces like demons, and so he frees her from seven demons. And that's why she became a follower. That's why she shows up at the cross on Friday and at the grave on Sunday, and Jesus reveals himself to her. Why? Because from the moment forward that she was set free, she follow Jesus. Well, when you find someone who can set you free, you don't want to walk away from them. That's who Jesus is. So that was one of Jesus' friends. Let me tell you about one of my friends. His name's Edward. And Edward, when I first met him, very successful in marketing. In fact, every marketing job he ever got, he kind of rose to the top. Just very good with people, very good in what he was doing. And so, so he, very successful career, great wife, kids, the whole thing, kind of living the American dream. And when you looked at him, you think, man, I, I wish my life was as good as his. But, but Edward had a secret. In fact, he was so good at what he did, and especially maybe sometimes in marketing, because you can be somewhat deceptive, he was good at hiding his secret from everybody, including his wife. Because of an injury that Edward had had, he had started taking pain meds to alleviate his suffering. Taking it from a doctor, prescribed, doing it legally, but it wasn't enough. So he started to figure out a system that he could work doctors and he could work pharmacists and he could start getting multiple prescriptions from multiple different areas and he could pretty much live on painkillers 24-7. And for a while he did it successfully. Nobody knew except for him. But the pain meds weren't enough. So he kept taking more and more and more and before you know it, his world started to crumble. Because when you can't get more and you have to find more, you start doing things that you would have never done before, like stealing money from your employer. And then when you lose your job and you get another job and they find out that you have that issue, you get fired again, and then you go on to your third job and you're struggling, and then your wife finds out. Edward's wife found out. She was not happy because then she said, our whole life is a lie. You've been lying to me the whole time. She's ready to leave. She's ready to just throw in the towel. I don't want to be with you because you're deceptive. So he hits rock bottom. He's lost three jobs. He's about to lose his wife. His kids don't like him. And Edward had been a part of church. But there was something Edward never did even though he went to church. He never fully knew Jesus. Because he's a successful Christian too because, hey, you can come to church and not know Jesus. Sorry to say, but it's true. And he did. But then he realized that his religion, his 
devotion to going to church and doing the ritual was empty because it couldn't answer to his addiction in his life. Until one day, Edward finally realized the reason he was struggling so bad is because he couldn't change himself and he needed somebody beyond himself to change him. That's when he finally surrendered his life to Jesus. Now, before that point, he was going to AA. He was going to counseling. He was trying everything in his power to free himself from the addiction. You know what? After he knew Jesus, he did the same things, but the outcome was different. Why? Because Edward was different. Because his issue wasn't modifying his behavior. His issue was his soul. His issue was he needed something internally to be transformed and changed so that those things on the outside actually could help him sustain recovery in his life. Fast forward to today. Edward's marriage didn't end. Edward got another job, still successful in what he does in his career. In fact, a few years after all this unfolded, he and his wife were actually in our church and actually in other areas of the world doing some small conferences to tell people how God restores broken people and men's marriages. How in the world does that happen when you finally meet somebody who can set you free? Jesus has the power to set you free because Jesus has the power over what? Death. And if you have power over death, you can set free people free from addiction because there is no greater power. So that's the first thing. You and I need someone to set us free. Second thing, why we need the resurrection is that you need someone who can restore your story. So let's talk about Peter. And if you haven't been in church much, you've probably heard of Peter. Lots of stories about Peter. And a couple of stories that stand out is Peter has this really, really great moment at the end of the Gospel of John where he encounters Jesus after Jesus, is, he, he died, he rose from the dead. And then what we would say, he reinstates or re, re, kind of uh, reconciles with Peter, brings Peter back after there's a violation, which we'll talk about in a moment. And it's this great moment where pretty much Jesus says, Peter, I love you, and because I love you, your life has a different trajectory, and now you're going to go make a difference in the world for me. And if you continue reading on, you read into the book of Acts, Peter's really central, chapter 2, preaches the best message of all time. 3,000 people get saved. All these amazing things that Peter does. But where does Peter's story start? It doesn't start in John 21. It starts a lot earlier. In fact, it starts with a pattern in Peter's life where he's very eager to jump in. Whatever Jesus says, Peter jumps in. But sometimes he jumps in so much that he knows better than Jesus. And many times, Peter, Jesus will say something and Peter will correct Jesus or he'll add to it because he knows just a little bit better than Jesus. And one of those times is that Jesus tells his disciples over and over again, I'm going to die and then I'm going to rise from the dead. And they're like, no, 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 Jesus, you don't get it. That's not the way it works. In fact, Peter does that multiple times. And then Jesus actually says, Peter, not only am I going to do that, but you know what? One thing you're going to do that you would thought you would never do is that you're going to deny me three times. And Peter says, absolutely not. That would never happen. I would always maintain my relationship with you. I'm always going to be loyal to you. And then Luke 22, verse 54 to 62. Look at the screens and read over from your, your Bible if you have one. It says, then they seized him, speaking of Jesus, and they led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I don't know, I don't know him. And a little later, someone else said to him, You all, all also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. It's the lowest moment of Peter's life. Why is this so significant? Because Peter had violated the most important relationship in his life. And at that moment, the wheels came off. Can you imagine the loyalty with a friendship and, and you're in a good relationship and you c commit to something and you're never, ever going to violate that relationship and then it comes to pass. And I, man, I can't imagine what it felt like where it says that the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Now, in, if it was me, I would be like, Peter, I told you so. But I don't think that's the way Jesus was looking. I think, I think Jesus' heart was broken because he knew what Peter was going to do and Peter ended up doing it. The significance of this moment is this. You and I have to understand, God created us to be in relationships, but here's the challenge all of us face. We live with broken relationships. We do. 
That's part of being human. That's part of the struggle that we have. It's a broken relationship with a spouse. It's a broken relationship with a parent or a child. It's a broken relationship with God. And when relationships are broken, the wheels come off of our lives. Relational brokenness is probably the number one issue beyond physical ailments, beyond all the other challenges we have as being human. When we live in broken relationships, it affects every aspect of our lives. Because here's what happens. We are starting to write our own story of brokenness, which is not the story that God wants to write for our lives. That's why the good news about Peter is there's a Luke 22, but then there's a John 21. Where Jesus looks at Peter again and says, Peter, I love you. And this is what your life's going to be. This is the story I'm writing for your life. But Peter doesn't go forward unless what he's reconciled back with Jesus. His relationship was right. Jesus, why is this significant? Because for us, the depth of pain that we feel at being broken in relationships with other people is unparalleled in our life. The brokenness we cause in other people because we violate relationship is unparalleled in their life. So let me tell you about one of my friends named Cindy. Now, Cindy was a person who uh, was raised in a household that had challenges, is an understatement. She incurred a lot of wounds in her own life in her upbringing. And because of that, she was very pained in her life. And so she became a very kind of sharp personality, cutting person, pretty divisive, because it's true. You've heard it said, but hurt people hurt people. And so she knew she had been hurt. And so as she got older, she became an adult. That became her way of life. So she would hurt people. And so because of that, when when I met her, I realized that I had seen the evidence of this in her life. Her marriage is barely hanging on. She's struggling. And I watched the relationship she has. I'm getting to know her. I'm realizing that there are people in two camps when it came to Cindy. They loved her or they hated her. And the hate camp was much bigger than the love camp. Because she was a wounded person and she was constantly violated. And she was miserable. Her life was filled with backstabbing and gossip and causing pain to other people because she didn't know how to resolve the pain in her own life. And the only way she knew how to resolve the pain was to cause pain for other people, and it still wasn't working for her. So when my wife Kim and I met her, we, we were sitting in my office and counseling her and talking her through this, and, and we realized that we had not even realized the full depth of what had gone on in her life until we realized from her and then from other people shortly before we had arrived at that church This girl, Cindy, had almost individually, single-handedly caused a church split in the church that we were now pastoring. She had taken a group of people, got them all upset at everybody else, got them to leave, and started something that eventually failed, and she was crawling her way back into the church somehow trying to find health again. So we sat with her, and, and I watched a woman deeply wounded, deeply hurt, but also wounding people around her. And so we, we almost had, it was almost like we had to bubble wrap her, honestly. Like, hey, there's some sharp edges that, that you have on you that you can't do that to other people. But we told her, the reason that you're doing this is because you have unresolved pain in your life that you've never walked through forgiveness from what happened in your childhood. You haven't experienced forgiveness in what happened in your adult life. There's so much brokenness in you, you're not able to truly be who God created you to be. And so we started walking her through this understanding. And here again, this is, this is the danger. She had been in church her whole life, but she had never fully surrendered her life to Jesus and understood his forgiveness. So she began to do that. And amazing things started to happen in her life. A woman who had never asked for forgiveness was asking people for forgiveness. A woman who had deep wounds from her family was finding a way to extend forgiveness to her family in their broken state. She found a way to love her husband, and her her husband, who is a saint, found a way to love her too, because she was difficult. But eventually she became the kind of person that, although she wasn't perfect, she learned how to navigate broken relationships in her life. And the story of her life changed. Because the story up until that point was what? Division and pain and hurt and hurting other people, and then it changed to forgiveness, compassion. In fact, I watched this woman who had very little compassion for anyone. Her and her husband got engaged in the foster care system, and I watched her care for some of the neediest kids in the system, and I saw her just ooze with compassion for them. Like, who is this woman? This is a woman who encountered Jesus. She knew she needed something. She didn't know she needed Jesus until she found him, and then she realized he was the answer to the brokenness in her life. I share Cindy's story so that you understand how many of us find ourselves in that story. You're sitting here today and you have a broken relationship. 
Maybe your marriage is almost at the end. Maybe your marriage has ended, and there's wounds in you or wounds in other from you that have literally derailed your life. Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave because he has power over broken relationships. He can restore what we cannot. And it's the journey of forgiveness that he offers us, and he expects us to offer to other people through our lives. So we need the resurrection because ultimately we need Jesus to write a different story and restore our broken story. Then the final reason why we need the resurrection this morning is that you and I need the resurrection because we need someone we can trust. And this is a big one. The word belief, if you've been in the church or even in our culture, the, the word belief has taken on the, a different connotation than it was originally intended from when it was written in the Bible. We have a Western mindset. In our Western mindset, we think about facts and information. Not to a Jewish mindset 2,000 years ago. When the words like believe, faith, trust were used, they're relational terms. Not cognitive terms. But what we do is we say, if I believe the right facts, then I'll have faith. That's not faith at all. That's education. But what's true is if you have faith, if you believe with what Jesus offers, then you're saying, I trust. Trust is relational. Trust means I have to believe into, which means it's not, it doesn't matter really all the facts that I have lined up in my mind. Do I believe this person is trustworthy? Most of us, like, we struggle with that. We struggle to trust other people. I mean, let alone a God that I can't see. How am I supposed to trust him? Well, in steps Thomas, one of Jesus' earliest followers, one of his closest followers, he struggled with disbelief, just like you and I struggle with disbelief. And many of you know Thomas, because sadly, we add a little qualifier to Thomas's name. We call him what? Doubting Thomas. Which, by the way, don't use that phrase. The guys outlived that reputation way beyond what, it, what it, we put it in. But here's the reality. He wanted to believe in Jesus, but he wouldn't allow his brain to move from information to trust. We know that the pinnacle of his story comes when Jesus walks into the room after Jesus is risen from the dead and gives him the physical evidence that he had asked for, which was, I need to be able to touch him. I need to be able to see him. I need to be able to experience him. Otherwise, I'm not going to believe anything. But where does, where does Thomas ask for that? Listen to where Thomas's doubt shows up. John chapter 20, verses 24 to 25. It says, now Thomas, one of the 12 called the twin, was not with, uh, with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord but he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. So what's going on there? So let's just capture this for a moment. This is a true skeptic. The true skeptic will not believe, even if, if you go back, rewind a bit, Jesus told Thomas with all of the disciples, I'm going to die, and then I'm going to rise from the dead. Over and over and over and over again. So Jesus' word is not good enough for Thomas. Then the other disciples who've seen Jesus, they come and say, hey, Thomas, we've seen him. Remember what Jesus said? He actually did it, and Thomas is like, not buying it. The only way I'm going to buy this is if he walks into the room and gives me proof. Now we think, yeah, I would want that. And so we're like, Jesus, walk into the room and give me proof. But here's the issue. Thomas' issue was not information. Thomas's issue was trust. That's what it was. Because even the greatest skeptics in our world, the issue is not information. Because I have seen people who have more knowledge than anybody I know, and they still don't trust. Because information and trust are two different things. Because information doesn't always lead you to trust. In fact, for some people, it leads them away from trust. So Thomas's issue really isn't that he has to have the facts. It's that he's struggling with, can I trust what Jesus said is really true? Because if it's true, I'm all in. It's a trust issue. And that's what Jesus was trying to get at. And that's why I'm convinced Jesus walks in and, and meets the demand of Thomas and says, okay, Thomas, here you go. And then if you read through the passage, his, his response is, my Lord and my God. He realized who Jesus is. But for all of us, the issue is really trust. How do I trust a God I can't see? How do I trust that maybe a God that I don't even believe in? So enter my friend named Janet. Janet was a skeptic. And Janet was a successful businesswoman, highly educated, who had no need or any room for God in her life. But a couple of really bad things happened to her. Not bad, but actually good, but in her mind it was really bad. Her husband found Jesus. 
she was not happy. Because she was successful, she didn't need God. In fact, when her husband found Jesus, she looked at him and this is what she said. And She said, I don't need God because I'm not weak like you are. And so that was really bad news. But you know what was even worse? Then their daughter found Jesus. So now she's in a household with two people who are following Jesus because their lives have been transformed. And they're trying to get her to church and she doesn't want any part of it. They kept going after her and going after her. They kept talking about God. And so I remember talking extensively with her husband. Every, ch- every Sunday he'd come to church, it was almost the same conversation. I've been praying for my wife. I really wanted to come to church. I want her to know Jesus, but she's just resistant. I'm like, that's okay. It's all right. Just keep praying for her. Just keep praying for her. She never, ever set foot in our church. Never would have a conversation with me because she had no need for God. But then her world fell apart when her husband died suddenly. So now she's at a place where, let's just go the information route. Well, if she's going to go informationally, okay, my husband's died. He was following God. I don't need God. If that's what happens when you follow God, then I'm good. I'm in the right spot. But that's not what she needed. She needed information. She needed someone she could trust. So I remember the day she came in and had an appointment with me after her husband died. We were trying to help her walk through the grieving process. And it was almost like when she walked into the church, there was almost this physical repulsion. Like, I don't want to be here. I'm only here because my world's upside down and somebody needs to help me, but I don't really need all this. We sat down, and she was very closed and very resistant, but I was, we were trying to care for her as a church. And so I kind of set up what we're going to do. Here's how we kind of do a memorial. We're going to honor your husband. A lot of people loved him and knew him in the church, and I said there's going to be a lot of people there. And so we're walking through all the details. We finish the meeting. She leaves, and in my mind, I'm praying, but I'm thinking that's the last time I see her until the memorial, and that's it. The next Sunday, she walks into church. This is before the memorial even happened. She walks into church, and I'm thinking, what is she doing here? Not, I mean, you're welcome here, but I mean, <laughs> someone who doesn't have need for God, someone who's too good for God, someone who's too smart and too educated, she walks in, sits in the back row, doesn't talk to anybody. As soon as the service is over, she leaves. She's out. I'm like, wow, that's an improvement. But I'm like, that's the last time I see her. Memorial comes, lots of emotion. Next Sunday, she shows up again. I'm like, no way, two in a row. This is amazing. She's actually here. Still didn't talk to anybody. Third week, she walks in. I think this time she actually sat with her daughter who had been trying to drag her mom to church. So she's sitting there. This time she stayed around maybe two minutes after the service is over and then she was out. Fourth week, she shows up. She actually shows up before the first song and stays 10 minutes after church and talks to people. Fifth week, I'm like, all right, I got to figure out what in the world is going on with Janet. So I finally corner her because she's like out the door. I'm like, what is going on? She goes, I don't know. She said, I, I, when my husband was alive, I had, I had no patience for his talk about God, about church. I never wanted to come to church. She goes, but I've been showing him up here, up here week after week after week. And this, these people have something that I don't have. And they're showing me love that I've never experienced. And it was almost like she was mad about it. It's like, don't make me like God. Sixth week, she gave her life to Jesus. Two years later, she met another guy, got married, and I watched this woman who had no place for God in her life following Jesus. And I told her and some other people, I told her, I said, you know, your husband, I guarantee if he could come back, he wouldn't do it because I know in his mind, him dying was the catalyst for you knowing Jesus made his life worth every moment. Because someday she knew there would be a reunion. She'd get to see him again. So I share about three of Jesus' friends and three of my friends because I am convinced that you and I need the power of the resurrection. We need Jesus. And we can mess around. We can try all kinds of things. And we can be our own God because that's what the battle is. The battle of human history is who's going to be God. Us or God. That's the battle. And God's letting us figure out that we're not good at it, and he's patient. That's what Peter actually writes in one of the other books. God is patient. The reason Jesus hasn't returned yet, because he's waiting for us to wake up. You can't follow yourself. You'll follow yourself into a corner, but you can't follow Jesus because he leads to life, because he's the only one who has power over death. That's what Easter's about. That's why we do it. And Easter's not just one Sunday a year. Easter is every single day. The power of the resurrection comes to bear on every aspect of our life every single day. It gives us the ability and the hope that somebody is greater than us. Someone can set me free. It can help somebody can come alongside of me and rewrite the bad story that I'm writing and write it the story that God wants for my life. And ultimately, he gives me somebody that is trustworthy. 
because they all thought Jesus lied. When, can you imagine if you were on Friday and he's saying, yeah, remember he said he was going he was, he was to raise from the dead? He's dead. Saturday had to be a rough day. But then Sunday came and changed everything. Why? Because then they all realized Jesus is trustworthy. Jesus came through and delivered on what he said he would do. And now all of human history can change. So I'm going to ask the worship team if they would come join me. We're going to sing one last song together. But I, I'm, I'm convinced that, is again, what we just talked about a moment before, information is helpful as long as it leads to trust. But information that never leads to trust is just information. Jesus didn't come to fill our brains. Jesus didn't come to educate us. Jesus came to transform our souls. And in order for our soul to be transformed, you and I have to be willing to trust him. That's why all six people we talked about today all came to the same conclusion. Not only in a moment did they surrender their lives to Jesus, but all six of them did the next step. They followed Jesus. See, because it isn't just a moment where you encounter God and say, okay, I'm going to give you all my stuff and all my sin and all my brokenness and all the things I can't figure out. And then you walk away and you just live the life you want to live. No, no, you're just, that means you're going back to do what you did before. It's a change in direction. It's a change in course of your life. That's why when Jesus came, one of the things I love that always frustrates me, but it's so good because he's God and he knows best, is Jesus never came and, and said, okay, I'm going to put you through school and give you lots of facts about who I am, and then you're going to believe me. No, Jesus encountered people, he transforms their lives, and then he always repeats these two words. Follow me. Because it isn't about the moment, it's about a lifetime. Because what Jesus is saying is, you've, you've lived your life being your own God. You've tried your best, but... But I've been watching and I know what's going on in your life and I know and it breaks my heart because I never created you to live this way and I've set up a way for you to live as a human being that yeah, I know it looks restricted and it looks difficult but it's the way that you work best because I created you and in order for you to get back to that story, I came into your story. I came into your world. I came as a human being, even though I was God, so I could experience what you experience every day. But here's the beauty of what Jesus did. He did it with perfection. He lived human life the way humans are supposed to live. That's why when he says, follow me, he's saying, look at the way I lived. Look at the way I loved people. Look at the way I loved my enemies. Look at the way I forgave. Look at the way that I was generous. Look at the way that I connected with the Father in heaven. That's the way human beings are supposed to live. And then the beauty of his perfection is when he dies, because he's perfect, he rises from the dead. And this is the beautiful thing about when Jesus says, follow me. He doesn't just say, follow me to death. He says, follow me through death to life. So this is the insurance, the, excuse me, wrong word, but actually probably a good faux pas on my part. Jesus didn't come to give us fire insurance. Oh yeah, I gotta pray the prayer, I gotta make the emotional response so I don't go to hell, please. Jesus is not the booby prize, okay? He's not. He offers us life, not just the avoidance of death, which means I get Jesus in this life because when I say yes to Jesus, he sends his spirit to live and work inside of me, but then he puts his spirit in me not only to work in my life now, but the Bible actually uses this term, as a deposit for my inheritance in the future. So that means when I get Jesus, death becomes a doorway, not a dead end. So when you and I lose our life, that's why Paul wrote it this way. He said, I gain. Why? Because I'm not in this physical world anymore. I'm not suffering anymore, but where am I? I'm in the presence of God, the way God created me to be in relationship with him. That's the good news. And Jesus offers this gift of transformation and following him to every single human being. But just like the six people we just talked about, you have to make a decision. Information's not enough. Trust is what Jesus would, would want and trust is what we need. So I'm gonna pray in a moment, but I wanna give you an opportunity when I pray that if you're here today and you're, you're saying, yeah, I know that's me. Maybe you fit into the story of one of the people we talked about, but you know that the answer ultimately is that you're here today, whether you knew it or not when you walked in the door, but you know now that you're here because you want to meet Jesus. You want Jesus to be the one that leads your life. Then when I'm going to pray, I'm going to ask you, you're just going to take a moment, you're going to surrender yourself to say, you know what, don't have all the answers, I know I'm not perfect, but man, I need to trust Jesus with my life. I'm going to choose to follow him today. And you can tell him that because by his spirit, he hears your thoughts, he knows your words, and he's working on your behalf to transform your soul. So would you pray with me as we respond today? Jesus, we thank you that on all of human history, you 
had orchestrated and planned knowing that we would walk away from you, all of humanity, that you made a way for us to come back, come back to the God created who created us, come back to experience your forgiveness, come back and realize that we can't change ourselves, but we know that you can bring freedom. You can rewrite our story because you are one who is ultimately trustworthy. So right now, Lord, I pray for those who maybe, Lord, this is their first time in encountering you. I pray right now by your spirit, would you meet them right where they're at as they say to you that we choose to follow you today. We choose to give our lives to you. And Lord, we know that when we give our life to you, what we're doing is we're giving everything. We're giving our sin and failure, our failed attempts at being our own God because, Lord Jesus, you were willing to take those things that we did, put them on your account, your perfect account, and then in exchange, Lord, when dying for our sin, you gave us your perfection, your righteousness, so that we could be like you, so that, Lord, death is not the end. Death is something that releases us ultimately into life with you. So, Lord, today, would you give us the courage to say yes to following you, to encountering you, to, in, to living a life that allows you to be the leader instead of us. We thank you, Jesus, that you are here today to do this in us, in your name. Amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to sing one last song together before we wrap up.